celebrating our 20th season. From the College by the Lake, meeting the personalities and discussing the issues that affect all of Coeur d'Alene and the Inland Northwest, we are the North Idaho College Public Forum. And now, here's your host and moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. One of the exciting things about doing this program is that even after 20 years, we find new topics to discuss that we have not had on the program before, although there's a number of topics that we do repeat uh, from year to year. Our subject today is cycling in the Pacific Northwest, and as I indicated with this introduction, it is our first time to ever deal with that issue. We're very fortunate to have on our program two guests who are highly qualified to discuss with you uh, the history of cycling and also their participants in that particular activity, and they have brought some things with them to show you that will be very exciting. Uh, first of all, welcome to the program Dr. Kenneth Wright, who is a member of the faculty at North Idaho College, and he teaches uh, in the field of chemistry and environmental sciences. Uh, Dr. Wright was uh, on sabbatical last year in England uh, under a Fulbright and has returned, and, and Ken, it's very good to have you home, and uh, we're not looking forward to doing this program, but uh, also discussing on another program, your trip to England. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that too. And I'm also very pleased to have Dr. Richard Smart, who is a physician in Idaho, and he is partners with uh, Dr. Wright in this sport of cycling, and uh, Dr. Smart, thank you so much for coming and being with us. Well, thank you. And it's always a pleasure to have on our panel, our regular panelists, uh, Janelle Burke, who is an attorney in the state of Idaho, and Steve Schink, who is Dean of College Relations and Development at North Idaho College, and I shall ask Janelle to commence the questioning. This is a very interesting sport that you're involved in. Dr. Smart, can you tell us, please, what is real cycling? Well, real cycling is a sport where a, a bicycle is converted to ride on abandoned railroad tracks. And uh, as so many people know, abandoned railroad tracks go very interesting places. They, they follow lakes and they follow rivers. And they actually came before the roads when we settled the west. And it makes for a water grade climb. In other words, there isn't any steep grades and it's, you can carry a lot of weight on your outrigger and you go places nobody gets to see and uh, you, you travel much further in a day than you would uh, backpacking. So it's sort of a way of getting into the backcountry without having to walk, right? You pedal. E exactly. Um, you, I, we've seen just about every type of wildlife from the, from the rails and it's, it's quiet. Um, most rail vehicles are noisy and these things are silent and you can come right up on we come up on wolves and fox and bear and deer and moose and cougar and just every, every animal in the Northwest we've seen, you know, by, by riding the rails. Well, can you tell us a little bit about the history of rail cycling? Is this a new thing or does it go back a long way? It, it goes back a long ways. It goes back into near the Civil War, um, the patent, when I patented my bike in, in 1980, uh, the patent search went back into the 1880s. So the people I actually competed against were from 1880 up to about 1918. Although in 1931 there was one fellow that, that made a bike that rode on one rail, which was really, really unique. <laughs> had a real wide front wheel and you had the balance. But. So just like people have always had sort of a fascination with the rails, mm -hmm. people have always had a fascination with riding on some kind of an apparatus that would get them down the rails other than a train, is that correct? That's, that's exactly right. Uh, some of the early pedal-powered vehicles and hand-powered vehicles, they were called velocipedes. And actually, the, the way those came about is that there was a fellow, I think there was a farmer who worked in, part-time in, in a small town, I think it was in the, in the Midwest, and he would ride the, he, he wanted to be able to ride on the rails to town. And uh, so he invented a, a machine that he could do that, and that was one of the, the very first you know, pedal-powered rail vehicles, and then the railroad bought his idea, and uh, he sold a lot of them. And and actually, he uh, he prevented a train wreck by, and so he almost became a local hero. And and so, human-powered rail vehicles have had a beautiful history in the railroad. That's most people are familiar with the pump car that you see on cartoons and any other. It, many times, uh, it's part of our our heritage. And the Velocipede was a machine with a, you pulled and pushed, and it's a real heavy machine. Now this is a, a real light machine, and these particular type were, 
were not used a great deal by the railroad, but they, I, I, I've read where they kept them in the baggage car, and if the train would break down, they, the brakeman could ride to get help. They also used them for track inspection. But they, they weren't very track worthy compared to the real heavy machines. And so I wanted to, to kind of bring them up to modern day standards and, and um, that's what you know, kind of inspired me. I wanted to see what I could do with some technology with an old, old art. And, and, and I have knew some I, fun at the same yeah, time. Yeah, and have a lot of fun. It's, it's more fun than inventing a can opener. You, know, you can get out and ride and enjoy yourself. So. Steve Sink. Ken, I, like most uh, people in this country, I grew up with a bicycle and I even worked for railroads for a while in my high school and college days, but I never put the two together before. I don't know that I have ever heard of this sport. How did you get involved in it? Well, I got into it really because of Dick. Uh, I was a patient of Dick's uh, in his dental practice. And uh, I think actually my wife did the original talking mm -hmm. and uh, you were talking to her about uh, rail cycling. She said, gosh, uh, you know, Ken would love to love to do that. He, he's crazy about railroads. His grandfather was a railroad engineer and, and he loves to get in the backcountry and we like backpacking and so Dick invited me to go along and we made a major trip and we've had such a good time that we've made uh, usually about one major trip each year and a number of other smaller trips. So When you talk about uh, a major trip on one of these cycles, what, what do you mean? How many miles? Would well, you uh, maybe at least a week and uh, 200 to 300 and some miles. I think our longest trip was 350 miles in 11 days in northern British Columbia. Were you cycling before you got into rail cycling? Uh, yes, I'd so the do a lot of bicycle are riding. Are there others uh, of you here in the Coeur d'Alene area? Are you two it? Well, we're pretty much it. Uh, I patented the bike and uh, I'm very cognizant of that these can be used in the, in the wrong manner. And uh, I've talked with uh, railroad people and, and I'm very careful with this. It's, uh, it's something that even abandoned tracks are privately owned, and I've ridden on railroads where I was like asked to go back to West Virginia and display or to demonstrate the rail cycle as a possible tourist ride in the state park system. And I've done that type of thing. And there is, I think, there's more and more uh, branch line railroads that are being developed in the, in the country that are kind of offshoots of the, of the main line. The, when you have a railroad like some of the old railroads like Great Northern, Northern Pacific, Union Pacific, Milwaukee, well then they consolidated. Most people realize the number one railroad in the Northwest is the Burlington Northern. And uh, a lot of the branch lines that, that go to maybe a little town with a great elevator, they, uh, they're not making it. And either they abandon them and tear up the tracks or they actually sell it to a smaller railroad company who can run it with more profitability. And um, the small railroad companies will be easier to work with. And I think they'll be probably in favor one of these days of having this, this, uh, this uh, you know, rail cycling used on days of, of no rail traffic. I'm talking about a short line, like a, a dead end line to make sure that there was, wasn't any trains. But it, it would be a beautiful way to utilize the resource that's already there. Um, you don't have to pave uh, railroad. You know, bicycle uh, paths need a lot of maintenance. You know, you get, asphalt that has to be patched and and actually a railroad track you can let it just sit there for 25 years and it's a wonderful pathway for for bicycles and my goal hopefully before I'm gone would be to have that happen and have some of these small railroads be able to utilize that these bikes are not you know I have never when I built these bikes I never wanted anybody to ever go out and ride active busy railroads that's crazy you know uh, but it's, it's a good way to utilize seldom used track and abandoned track. And uh, the railroad companies need to know that this can happen and it doesn't require, you know, they're worried about liability. They get so many lawsuits from automobile accidents on grade crossings and they're almost paranoid of the idea of anybody, uh, whether it's a hobo riding one of their boxcars or whether it's somebody out on their tracks. There are a lot of people get killed, a lot of people get injured and they have to be, it's going to have to happen with uh, a lot of understanding because it's, there's a still a long way to go and we're kind of, uh, you know, the start of a whole new type of recreation. Uh, it may never happen, but I'm, I would like to share this. I'd like to have people be able to enjoy it like I do. Uh, Dr. Smart, what we like to do on this program is to have what I call 
visual aids for our viewers, and I know they'd like to see some uh, photographs that you have brought uh, with you mm -hmm. uh, to show the kind of uh, places you've been and what it looks like. And if you'll take us through these photographs, the first one is up on the screen now. Okay, this is uh, several years ago. This is on the Milwaukee Railroad, which is a transcontinental, ra transcontinental railroad between Seattle and Chicago. And it was abandoned in 1980. And you can see there's starting to be some rock slides. As soon as the, it's abandoned, Mother Nature starts to take over. And I'm on an outing here with my children. And the boy that's furthest down the track there in the orange hat is, uh, is right now graduating from George Washington, so you can, George Washington University. So you get an idea how long ago that was. And they're clearing the track so we could make it through on a little Sunday excursion. So you do have those times that you have to uh, uh, stop and clear the way that you're going. It's not just automatic. Right. We actually could have wheeled the bike through that, but it was uh -huh. kind of fun to clear the track, so we made it a little easier. So we just, but it's it's actually you know, it's nice to have the clear track ahead. So, <laughs> right. I, I was thinking a minute ago when you were talking about that, that was a problem. Here's your next uh, photograph. Okay, this is an, a, a trussel in uh, in Idaho. This is one of the a uh, high wooden trussel, which is over 200 feet, which becomes quite spectacular when you ride across something like that. Yeah, there, there's some danger to this sport, isn't there? You, like, uh, you have a lot of places where you have heights and you're going over uh, right. really rough terrain. Yeah, this, this would be an area that I'd promote, you know, when I, when I talk about promotion, I'm talking about uh, trying to get something set up in a safe place with, with people who with you know, safe operation and no big tall bridges, you know, so that all people could be accommodated. But you know, it would be kind of fun if people could just go out and have adventure without worrying right. about being sued and all the problems that with having fun yeah. are all about. But but I don't want you know I don't want people to think that this is for everybody because right. it isn't. But I, we feel very safe because we've ridden about fifteen thousand miles on the on the rails and we have a feeling that you know just you get from experience. Right, here's another shot of one that's where it's a high mm -hmm. uh, pass going through. Um, do you ever come to places too where the, the rails uh, are completely out and you have to carry your bike or, or do you scout out uh, before you take right. a, shot, a particular there's trip? A, there's a lot of times that we come to, to dead ends where there's rocks or there's a mudslide or there's huge trees or there's brush or there's, uh, you know, there's every Every obstacle is there. I, once I rode along and along the Ponderay River, and there was uh, thousands and thousands of caterpillars on the track, oh, and it yeah. it got like glue in the guide wheel system, and it was just <laughs> gooey, messy. <laughs> I mean, there are all kinds of interesting obstacles. But I'm an adventurous soul, and I really enjoy the obstacles. I that's one of the more fun parts, is because you're away from every around next. You don't know what's around the next curve, and that's what makes it fun. I would be, if I was an old timer, I mean, many centuries ago, I think I'd be an explorer because I like well, that. Well, you're a little bit of a clown, too. I think that's a <laughs> shot of you, isn't it, here, Dr. Smart? Right. This is in Montana Canyon <laughs> over on the Milwaukee. Um, that's on 16 Mile, which is the section of the Milwaukee that was probably the prettiest, maybe a tie for the prettiest with the area around Avery. Uh -huh. But they actually had open observation cars on the passenger trains that they would put on down on the Missouri River, and then they would let all these hundreds of people out on that open observation car, and, and they would guide them through this beautiful canyon, which is just spectacular. And uh, we got to have our own guide. It's very isolated. It's much like Avery area. I think that, that and, uh, photograph was real powerful because it shows the freedom, and you're, you're really oh, enjoying yourself. Oh, it's a wonderful yourself. feeling. You just want to, well, you can tell I don't have to say a whole lot when you see that <laughs> yeah. picture. That's one of those times when a picture's worth a thousand words. Here's another uh, nice photo. These are my two, my middle-born son and my youngest son, and National Geographic has come out to film us, and we're down by Harvard, Idaho, and that's, he looks pretty serious there. I think he just makes, well, doesn't want to screw up when the cameraman's on him, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah that, was, that wasn't too long ago that they came to uh, do a story about what you're doing. Uh, also, when you're on these trips, you, you mentioned animals, and so since there's not any noise and you get a chance to uh, come up on animals, uh, is, is there any danger in that? I, I heard you say cougars, and I, I instantly had a vision of one jumping off of the side of a mountain <laughs> at you. 
they're, they're very passive for the most part, and you don't get close to cougars. And the type of animals that we've, you know, even coming up on bears, we've been, Ken and I, in one section in the Canadian trip, we got in some real tough weeds, just incredible, incredibly tough, where it took an hour to drag our packs and our bikes, maybe a mile. And during that, in that little uh, section there, there, we were meeting bears all along the way, and we had a real close call with a bear where, what we call, say a close call, uh, just a, an encounter, and the bear came across the railroad track and looked at us and, and, and licked his tongue. He went like that from both sides <laughs> and looked at us and then walked on down the track. But uh, black bears, you know, we saw like 12 or 14 on that trip and from close, close range there. I think bears have a bad rep, you know, they, yeah. a bad rep. They, they don't deserve the, some of the publicity they get. The, the grizzly bears, we, we certainly have respect for, but, and I have, that's one of the few animals I haven't actually seen a live grizzly, but I've seen the tracks. Sure. Janelle Burke. We have here in the studio with us uh, one of your rail cycles, and so mm -hmm. let's let's uh, ask some questions about what it actually is. Uh, looks to me pretty much like a regular bike. How do you carry it when you're going to be going somewhere? Uh, do you do you are you able to to fold it up? Is that what you do when you're transporting it? Right, as you can see, the the guide wheel system right in front here folds up under the handlebars, and then the outrigger actually folds up behind the seat. Okay, so you can, can actually convert it to for road use in about 30 seconds. So it can be just uh, all folded up. Now, when you uh, say this this front part here that Ken just put up into the into the handlebars, wh what does that do, and where do you put that? Where does that actually run? Okay, this goes down on the rail. This is the guide wheel, and, and that's what helps you keep balance. The guide wheel is the, the guide wheel goes along the inside of the rail like a flange on a on a train, and these are the travel wheels. And the travel wheels right on top of the rail. And these are the magnets, and the magnets are an eighth of an inch off the top of the rail. And they give these they give these traction. And what what we've got here, if you turn it down, Kim, okay. this is a set screw right here, which when that set screw is is screwed in, this guide wheel, the whole guide wheel system here is set at six degrees to the outside of the track, and this is on a swivel. So as these little wheels are working to the outside of the rail, the guide wheel guides beautifully along the inside of the rail with very little friction. And then what is this long thing that goes out here uh, farther back closer to the seat? Uh, that okay. sits on the other rail then, I take it? Right, that's the, that's the outrigger, and as you can see here, why don't you demonstrate mm -hmm. that lever again? Just show them. Mm -hmm. Mic down where you can't get very right. Watch my microphone. Okay. Uh, the leveler is a mechanism that controls the tilt of the bike. And as he turns the handlebar grip, there's actually a Greyhound bus speedometer cable that's connected through the bike down to a gearbox, which lengthens and shortens a diagonal arm that goes to the outrigger, allowing the rider to upright himself uh, as necessary on a curve or some uneven roadbed. So you have to constantly be adjusting then. Right. The hands. Unless you're on straight track, the hands in rail cycling aren't used as much as the legs. Oh, I was thinking you could just ride along here and not have to do anything, but, but well, you do have to adjust for the way the, the track tilts then. Well, the bike ne didn't always have a leveler, and so w when, that, when we didn't have the leveler, it was like sailing. When you went around a curve, on a bank curve, you had to lean way to the <laughs> whatever way you had to lean to balance the bike. When it rode across on the Milwaukee from Seattle to Rosalia, Washington, or from close to Seattle, you actually, and the tracks were banked severely on the curves, and, and it was, it really was like sailing. You're up real high, because you're up on, not only a rail, but you're up on a tie and, a ba and ballast, and it's sort of like riding a horse when you're up that high. <laughs> okay, and, and, I ta and I see that you have a mirror on here, and you have, you have some other safety features, I take it. Uh, mm -hmm. The mirror shows you what's happening behind you, I, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, what about some of the other things that are on? Well, it's important when two fellows are riding on the same rail that they let the <laughs> fellow behind know what's going on. Okay, <laughs> I a, see what you that's You can uh, see some interesting wildlife and slam on your brakes and have major pileups and this type of thing. Um, so it's good to know how to look in the mirror and see how close the 
fellow's following you. It's, it's always important to be on the lookout when you're riding point, which is the first bike. The guy in back can bite his fingernails or eat his lunch or whatever he wants to do because he doesn't have to worry. He's on the same rail. And the guy in front's got to be looking for rocks. And if you've never been on this abandoned track and it's been years without any rail traffic, it's going to, you're going to have to be scouting out a little bit. Now, I have a question, Ken. Uh, when you come to a place where two rails have, are knit, uh, what happens then at that point? Uh, do, you, um, do you feel a jolt, uh, you know, when, where two rails come together? A track joint. Yes, yes, track joint. Uh, most of the track joints are pretty smooth, really, and you sail right over them with no difficulty. Uh, if there's a gap, and sometimes there'll be a gap, maybe uh, half an inch, on maybe the worst, You'll feel that on your on the outrigger. You'll feel the outrigger wheel just kind of bump a little bit. Uh, this part rides pretty smoothly over that. It's it's only when there's an obstacle really on the track, like a rock or a stick or or a uh, cow pie or something like that. <laughs> you have a serious problem. Now, how else do you keep your balance beside adjusting the uh, outrigger? Uh, how else do you keep your balance? Is it the same procedure as you would with a bicycle, or do you need to have a little better balance than that, too? No, you, you really don't need to have better balance. Anybody that can ride a bicycle can, in theory, ride one of these, because you don't need to balance. The outrigger does the balancing, and if you lean, since the, the tire rides, the tires ride on the right-hand rail, if you lean just a little bit to the left while the outrigger takes takes that force up. If you lean really hard to the right and you don't have enough weight on the outrigger, you can tip off the rails. And I did that one time going about 12 miles an hour and it was very unpleasant. <laughs> now, I also have a question about um, uh, where the, the tire itself fits. Does the tire also ride on the rail? Yes, the tires, both of them, ride right on top of the rail. And that's the key and that's what Dick developed so, uh, so well in his, in his research and development work was to figure out uh, the guidance system. This is really the key to the whole machine. Mm -hmm. And because the idea is you've got to keep that front tire on, that, on the top of that rail. And Dick found that uh, <clears throat> if the front tire stayed on the railway, the back tire tended to, to follow. And one time you had a set of extra guide wheels in mm -hmm. the back and he discovered they really weren't necessary. But uh, one thing you can't do, and that's you can't ride backwards <laughs> on these. You don't want to roll backwards. That's a, a serious mistake as I, as I learned. <laughs> <laughs> a Steve Shake. Ken, tell me, uh, how, how does this compare in terms of physical demand with just uh, riding a mountain bike like that Schwinn unmodified on the street? Well, probably easier. Of course, it depends on where you take your mountain bike. If you're a real enthusiast and you're riding up, up trails and up and down. How about level trails? to level? Uh, it seems like there's got to be some additional friction created yeah. by, the, by the, uh, the guides and apparatus that you've modified these things with. You're absolutely correct. Uh, on, on the level, why these are going to pedal a little harder and, and you're generally, you know, you're, these are about 85 pounds and so when they're, when they're folded up and you're riding down the road, uh, you, you notice that you're riding a fairly heavy bike. Uh -huh. and when we've had to uh, take off the rails and ride stretches of, of highway to get from one place to another, why you notice it. Uh, now, Dick, the last yeah. time I was in a bike shop, I don't remember seeing one of these. <laughs> this is obviously, it's your design, yeah. you've patented it. Yeah, Somebody else is interested in joining you in this sport. How do they get started? Well, you never will see one. Um, I manufactured about 29 of these bikes. And the people that are watching and the, the people here that have seen the movie Tucker, I was, it was very similar to the same feelings I had. I got a lot of uh, mail from like National Safety Commission and, and railroad companies and uh, not to do this. And I didn't want to cause them a problem. I seriously didn't want to do that. But I also didn't want to grow old and rock in my rocking chair and tell my grandchildren I never did it. So I decided to go ahead and at least make some of them. And I made 29 and I sold a lot of them to celebrities and they were used, a couple were used in Australia in a movie called The Quest with Henry Thomas, the same boy that was in E.T. And uh, some of the people that bought them were, it, concerned me a little because they were people who really didn't want to ride them. They were more as a, a conversation piece. And I wanted to, to hear the stories about where they've gone. Maybe I want to go where they went, you know. And, and that didn't really happen because not too many people who had the time, the people that had the time didn't have the money to buy one. And, and so it was, it, it got to a point where it was going to interfere with my life. And I'm very happy being a family dentist and I'm really involved in dentistry, in organized dentistry. And so I had to make some choices. So I, I did make enough that it satisfied that need to manufacture something. And uh, I didn't make enough to get myself in trouble with the, with the railroads. 
So I feel I've accomplished my goal, and some of the greatest moments in my life have been on the rails. Uh, I mean, I go to bed at night sometimes and put my head on the pillow, and that's, I think about some of these excursions, and that's how I drift off, you know. What, uh, what roughly is the cost? Uh, somebody, if somebody contacted you today, mm -hmm. would, you sell, would you make and sell a bike? And no. What, no, all right. Well, um, not without some, some work in the area of apprenticeship. Uh, I would like to know more about the person and, and see if they're genuinely interested in the sport and using the bike in the right manner. And if they satisfied all that criteria, then I probably would uh, agree to, to work with them. But it's, it's not something I just sell to a person that called, called up and asked about it. Ken, do you need to be a little bit of a mechanic when you're out on these? Do you have some <laughs> breakdowns? Is maintenance of the bike uh, uh, kind of a critical factor when you're on a, a long trip? Well, I've never seen a mechanical device yet that didn't break down, and these certainly are no exception to that. Yes, it certainly helps, and Dick's, a, Dick's of course, an expert mechanic on it, having developed them, and I like to, to work with automobiles and bicycles and you know, bike tools, so we do our own uh, repair work, including frame straightening on some of our trips for <laughs> where we had a major, major accident at high speed and bent the frame. Derailment, well, we used to call those. That it is a derailment. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> what it is. So. Yes, you need to, and we have a, there's a tool bag here on the, on the back of the bike. I don't know if that was showed up in the previous video or not, but there's a tool bag that we carry along. I, I might add that, that some of the astronauts have ridden these bikes, and uh, Joe Allen, who wrote Entering Space, he made a comment in this book where he, where he wrote a little passage that said that many of the things in this book about space and being in the shuttle are not nearly as hard as riding the rails. <laughs> 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 there is a little knack to it. And uh, uh, just about anybody can ride it on, on straight track, in, in, uh, or relatively straight track. But it's, there's an art to it, when, or some skills involved when you're riding in mountains and changing on switches. You can ride through most switches without getting off. And switches are locked, and the trains have to stop, and the brakeman usually has to throw the switch. But Ken and I know how to take these switches where you can slow down and make these little maneuvers to get through the switches. And we actually challenge each other to get through the, different, the various configurations of switches, which makes it fun. So we get a little competitive, but it's all in fun. We only have a minute left. Uh, very quickly, could you identify, are there more rails that are available that have been abandoned in the West, or are they all across the United They're States? They're all across the, the country. Some of the... They've taken out thousands and thousands of miles of them, and it's, it's the sad part of the sport is that I'll take somebody out to an abandoned track, and there'll be some truck there with the rails being loaded and the ties. And I've got to interrupt. I'm so sorry. We're out of time. I want to thank both of you gentlemen. It's been one of our most interesting programs. Uh, it's fascinating. Thank you for being with us. Ladies and gentlemen, I know you've enjoyed this program. I invite you to be with us again next week at the same time when we will discuss what we also believe to be a very interesting subject. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. The North Idaho College Public Forum was videotaped live from the studios of Telemedia Services on the campus of North Idaho College for viewing at this more appropriate time. We invite you to join us again next week for another all-new edition of the North Idaho College Public Forum on this public television station.